This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 30 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am so glad you are joining us today. I really do appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to join us on the Homestead Journey. This week, we hit a major milestone here on the podcast, and so I did want to start by just thanking you so much for helping us reach 10,000 downloads. So that is a, it's a big milestone for me, and uh, I never really, when I started this, wasn't quite sure if people would want to hear what I had to say, and so I just really appreciate um, those of you who have been with me from the beginning. Uh, And those of you who have been uh, joining lately, I just really, really appreciate um, you being a part of this journey. And uh, I've heard from a number of you lately and just encouraging things. And so um, I just really appreciate that. Um, And so, again, thank you very much. 10,000 downloads. uh, Very, very excited about that. I guess I've also forgotten to introduce myself. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And when I say beautiful, I guess beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, Yesterday, we actually had snow and we had significant snowfall. Now, here on our homestead, we might have had maybe a couple of inches But uh, some friends of ours not that far away had four, five, six, some people were saying as much as eight inches of snow on May 9th. I tell you, folks, uh, I love snow, um, but not now. Okay, not now. (laughs) But my grandfather used to say, whether the weather be cold, whether the weather be hot, the weather's the weather, no matter the weather, whether we like it or not. And so whether or not we liked the snow, um, it was here. And other people used to refer to it. I've heard it referred to as poor man's fertilizer. So I guess we'll just take it as poor man's fertilizer. Anyhow, enough of that. Let's jump right into this week's episode with this week's Homestead Happenings. So I guess this week it's a matter of, do I give you the good news first or the bad news first? So what do you want? Do you want the good news or the bad news? (laughs) And that's the way it is on the homestead, folks. Um, I just want to keep it real with you. And I think sometimes people have a tendency to share the beautiful pictures uh, on Instagram and Pinterest and Facebook, uh, the, the good news. And sometimes we have a tendency to kind of gloss over the hardships. And I don't want to dwell on the hardships because hardships, uh, I think it's all relative um, depending on what your particular situation is. Certainly the hardships I'm going to share with you today are definitely, I think, in the first world problem category. But we had some things this week on the home set that just didn't necessarily go according to plan. So as I shared with you last week, we put our meat birds out on pasture and then we put a guard goose in with the meat birds this year, trying something a little new because in the past we have lost some birds to aerial predators. Unfortunately, it seems like either our guard goose isn't guarding very well or this whole guard goose keeps away aerial predators thing is an absolute myth. Because unfortunately, we ended up losing two of our meat birds to aerial predators. So we have everybody locked into the mobile coop uh, for the duration, and I'll drag it around. It's definitely, I prefer it when they can kind of come in, go um, out of that, because it is a little bit on the smaller side. Um, But it is what it is, and so we ended up feeding the uh, wildlife a little bit this week with regards to that. We also had one just, and it happens with the meat birds, but periodically one will just keel over. Um, And I'm not sure if it was a heart attack or if it just got trampled or or what happened, but uh, we we lost three of our meat birds this week. In other bad news, (laughs) like I said, I'm going to show the bad news first. Yesterday we were down in the basement. My wife walked past our freezer and she said, this doesn't sound right. And opened it up, and yes, it was definitely not 
keeping temp like it should. Um, things were still frozen solid, but not as solid as you would expect them to be or as they should be. And so we went ahead and, uh, did some sorting out of some things and consolidated everything into our smaller chest freezer. And I was very thankful that we had the chest freezer to begin with, that we could consolidate everything. And we're at that time of the year where kind of you're, you're tailing off where you've eaten a lot of the frozen vegetables. You know, you've eaten some of the frozen meat. We're, we're out of, I think we have one meat chicken left. And so I was very thankful that we were able to do the consolidation, but I have a problem. And that is in three weeks, I have 20 some odd, hopefully it'll be 20 some odd, um, meat birds on the way to freezer camp and I don't have a camp for them. So yesterday we went out and looked for a freezer and Lowe's and Home Depot and Best Buy are all sold out. Um, I called some of the smaller independent uh, retailers and the one guy said that he had been sold out of freezers for six or seven weeks and his suppliers were telling him that they would not be able to get him freezers until July or August. Now, the one that we have may be repairable. Uh, the guy that I usually use for a repair, the company I usually use for repair, uh, right now due to the COVID situation are only open during the week, so Monday to Friday. And so I'm not even sure right now if they are dispatching people uh, to homes to do appliance repair. So we'll see whether or not we can repair the uh, freezer that is not working properly. But uh, in the meantime, I'm looking and I might have, I, I think I've got one lined up, a used freezer. But uh, who would have thought that I, you know, we would have a freezer go and not be able to go down and buy another freezer? Um, just absolutely a bizarre time in which we live. And I never would have thought I needed to have a backup freezer on hand. So, and it's one of those situations, folks, where I'm, I'm really struggling here to understand, you know, you, you try to always have a backup plan, but you know, how, at, at what point do you draw the line? You know, my, my house isn't that big, so I can't have a backup to everything. And I uh, just never really expected that we would find ourselves in the situation. Now, again, we were very, very thankful that we were able to consolidate everything um, most of the meat we were able to keep. There was some stuff that really needed to be discarded anyhow because it was freezer burnt. Um, and there were a few vegetables that we went ahead and fed to the chickens. There was nothing wrong with them, but it, we just didn't have room. And so it was a matter of, okay, what can we sacrifice and figuring, okay, the garden is going to be coming in. We'll be having fresh vegetables, some of the ones that we had frozen last year. We'll turn into eggs. And so that's what we did, but there was something a little bit discouraging, uh, but thankfully we were again able to, to save most of it. But because of that situation, I had some fat that I had in the freezer that I hadn't rendered yet. And so I'm in the process right now of rendering lard uh, because we didn't want to put that back in the freezer just to consolidate uh, and save space. And one of the things that I was very thankful about is we have pressure canner. So I could have pressure canned up um, a lot of the meat that's there. Uh, I'm not sure it would have been optimal to do that, but I certainly could have done it. We have the jars, we have the pressure canners, we have the lids. Uh, we, you know, we have the skill set to be able to do that, but thankfully it didn't come to that. On to the good news, though. Enough bad news. On to the good news. This week, uh, the garden is just starting to come to life. Even though it's been cold here the tail end of the week, the beginning part of the week, it was very warm. We were in the 70s, and so things are really starting to pop out in the garden. So that's very exciting. Got some more stuff planted this week, and my new tool, I wanted to say new toy, but we'll call it my new tool, arrived this week, and I posted pictures of it on Instagram and Facebook, but it's a broad fork from Treadlight Broad Forks. And so I was able to get my Ruth Stout bed all broad forked this weekend. And so that's very, very exciting. And so hopefully the end of this week, we will start getting a lot of stuff planted out into that bed. I'm in the process of hardening off my transplants. So the end of this week, 
fingers crossed, God willing, we will start getting some of that stuff out there into the Ruth Stout bed. We have peas up out in the Ruth Stout bed. That's very exciting. The potatoes haven't started popping yet, but uh, I can't imagine it won't be long and they'll be uh, up. But that'll be nice to get some other stuff out there and really get that experiment underway. Finally, um, we have a couple of geese that are setting. And uh, this week, they have started the, the, the little goslings and ducks because we've got the geese and ducks together. And I'm not really quite sure what's under each goose. But uh, we have some little hatchlings coming out. So I'm not sure if they're goslings or ducklings. But uh, it is great to kind of hear those peep, peep, peeps. And uh, very excited about that. So that's what we've had going on here on the homestead this week. Some good, some bad. But at the end of the day, folks, the fact of the matter is it's all good. And uh, I'm very, very blessed to be able to live this lifestyle and even, you know, the situations that were, well, less than according to plan, it wasn't, it wasn't the end of the world. It's all good. We didn't lose any food. Uh, and even those chickens that uh, the, the hawks got, what was left, went to the pigs and uh, we're turning that into bacon. So it's all good. All right, let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. This week, I am very, very excited to share with you an interview. This is the first interview besides Brian Jr. Uh, not discounting that because I got a lot of great feedback on my interview with Brian Jr. But uh, this is the first, we'll call it an off-farm interview <laughs> on the Homestead Journey podcast. And very, very excited today to follow up last week's episode where we talked about raising rabbits with an episode dedicated to the idea of raising quail. And as I shared with you last week, I know nothing about raising quail, but I do know someone who does raise quail. And so I am so excited and honored to welcome to the podcast, none other than Harold Thornbro from the Modern Homesteading Podcast. Harold, welcome. Well, thanks, Brian. I'm, I, it's a joy to be here. I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you. I mean, I had you on my podcast not so long ago, so it's uh, it's like talking to a friend right over again. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I, I really was honored to uh, join you on your podcast. It was a lot of fun, and so looking forward to continuing that conversation. Um, for those of you, and, and Harold really doesn't need any introduction, but uh, for maybe the one or two people who aren't familiar with who Harold is, he um, is the author of From Home to Small Town Homestead, um, the book on pursuing self-sufficiency and sustainability no matter where you live. He is a blogger and a podcaster, and uh, you've been doing this for a while. Yeah, I think, uh, what, five, six years now, something like that, yeah. And, and I have your book right here. I'm about halfway through it, really enjoying it. And obviously, as we talked last time, but you and I really share a, a passion for helping people on this journey towards self-sufficiency and sustainability. And really, no matter where you live is, well, that's really your story. Yeah, it is. 2012, you know, I had, uh, I had uh, stage three colon cancer and, uh, you know, I lived in town and, but my dream all my life had been, you know, I wanted to, to homestead to have a little farm, you know, to be out in the country. And I found myself in a position where I, I couldn't move to the country, but yet wanted a homestead, wanted to grow some food, some good, healthy food. And I was pretty limited on, on my space. I was on a 10th acre lot and, uh, I thought, wonder what I could do here. And through, you know, the, the, the wonders of YouTube and blogs and things like that, I was able to uh, uh, kind of just see what other people were doing on limited space like that. And it was really inspiring to me. And the next thing you know, we were growing a whole bunch of food on a really small lot. And um, it just kind of went from there, you know, and it's, it's something that's been a passion of mine to, uh, to kind of convince other people that, hey, start doing it right where you're at because you'd be really surprised at just how much you can do. And I think that's I think that's so important because it's not that you and I are trying to squelch or squash anybody's dream of the five, the ten, the fifteen, the twenty acres mm -hmm. of land. That's a great dream. It's a great goal, but you don't have to wait for that. Yeah, absolutely. And and you might even find that it's just not 
in the cards for you ever. I mean, uh, the reality is most people, most people in the United States, especially live in the city. Most people live on standard city, you know, lots where what we call a, a postage stamp lot where you just, it might be where you spend your entire life in places like that. And, and if that's the case, it doesn't, it doesn't it have to stop you from being a homesteader. Absolutely. And your story is something that is just simply proof that you don't have to have the five, the 10, the 15, the 20 acres of the land to grow, raise and grow a lot of your own food. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's been, it started out gardening and then it's even went into some livestock uh, since then, you know, we haven't been able to, uh, uh, really focus on rabbits and quail um, over these last couple of years and uh, rabbits been a little bit longer and I started doing quail I think three years ago and really enjoyed uh, raising those that's become probably my uh, my livestock of, of choice in a uh, in a small space awesome um, and and that's that's a great segue right there because last week I did an episode on raising uh, meat rabbits and that's something that uh, we've done here although right now while we have we have two free loading does um, because my buck died and I just have not had the heart to send them over the rainbow. So um, I've kind of turned, ah, I've always said we're not going to have pets, but I just can't bring myself to do it. Yeah, I, I get that. I had the same breeding uh, 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 pair for quite a while and uh, I ended up, I had them for so long you know, I, I ended up with some other uh, breeding pairs after a while and I'd had that original pair for so long that I, I just couldn't uh, do it either. I ended up giving them to a friend. <laughs> I'd, I've got to find, I, well, actually I did have somebody approach me looking for breeding stock. And I was like, well, I have a couple of does, yeah. but they weren't, they weren't interested. But yeah, so last week we talked about, um, I, I talked about the rabbits uh, as, a, as a homestead meat source, a protein source. Um, but definitely really interested in picking your brain with regards to quail, because that is something that I've been interested in doing, but I haven't done up to this point. And so I was really excited when you were willing to, to jump on here and share your expertise with us, um, with regards to quail. And then what I'd like to do is kind of, maybe we can talk the pros and cons of, of rabbits versus quail. Now, have you done meat chickens yet? Well, I, I grew up with chickens. I mean, we raised chickens my whole life. You know, we always had uh, chi uh, chickens for eggs and for meat. And uh, I had one go of it on this piece of property, but because I live in a small space in town, it's just, it wasn't really convenient for me. And, uh, I, I think it was just a little bit too much for what I had here. So we kind of went and just uh, stayed with the rabbits and the quail and, and that seemed to work out a lot better, but yeah, have done it, but uh, just on a really small scale here, but definitely grew up with them and we did it on a, you know, we, I wouldn't say a large scale, but we always had, you know, 20, 30, 40 <laughs> chickens at a time growing up. Mm -hmm. Well, great. So then, so then maybe here towards the end, we can kind of talk the pros and cons of maybe those three different um, options, but jumping right into quail, you said you've been doing that for about three years now. Yeah, I think I got my first. Uh, now, now these are Japanese Caternix quail. Uh, I've never raised the Bob White quail, and I think there's some different challenges with them. I find the Caternix quail just just super easy to uh, to raise in cages, or you can lay, uh, raise them in an aviary. Um, I've had them on the ground before, but I find it just easier to raise them in cages. So, are they like? Uh, is it like a rabbit cage that you're raising them in? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, similar. I mean, it's just the same size, pretty much. Uh, uh, you can buy the standard rabbit cages that are like a, say, like a 36 by 36 or whatever. I actually built my own cages. They're a little bit shorter than that, but about that, uh, a little bit and a little bit longer than that. But yeah, that's, you know, roughly the dimensions of, of the uh, quail cages. Okay. And you said they're Japanese Caternix. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Caternix quail. And I, like I said, I really like them because they seem to just do really well. Uh, really well in a in a small space in a cage Th they seem completely content i mean they don't really um uh they, they just seem like they're really happy birds to be in that kind of an environment okay with with regards to the this kind of this setup that you have um how many you know, i guess how do you div divvy up your your breeders versus in rabbit term, we would call them feeders. I'm not sure what it is in quail terms. <laughs> well, here, what I do is um, I put four uh, hens to one rooster in each cage uh, that size. So you can put about five, uh, uh, you know, in each four or five in each cage. I, I think if you get over five, they start fighting. And it's just been my experience. I've tried it. They, they have plenty of room because they're a really small bird, but they will fight if you get too many in there. So four or five per cage, one rooster per cage. And um, so I always have fertilized eggs. 
And so every, every one of my birds is for meat or, and eggs. I mean, I get as many eggs as I can from them for a few months and then they, uh, they become meat birds. And I just keep this constant rotation of eggs in the incubator. Um, and I just always, you know, introducing new uh, birds and, and calling the older ones. Okay. With quail, we use the term rooster and hen, just like with chickens. Yep. Yep. Just like with chickens. Um, okay. And, and the roosters do crow. Oh, <laughs> not, do they? Not, not like a chicken. It's a, it's a, uh, it's loud, but it's different. You know, it's not annoying. Like, <laughs> I don't think it's quite as annoying as a, as a, a chicken a rooster, but it, it definitely, um, it definitely is allowed. So, you know, <laughs> you can definitely have too many, uh, uh, roosters and quail as well. And it can get really, really loud. And, and it's kind of a, I don't know if you've never heard one. It's, it's very unique. Um, which is what I like about it because if you're in a place, say where maybe you're not supposed to have livestock because it's such a unique sound and because people just don't know that sound, People they, just don't, they just don't know what it is. They think it's, kind of, off. it's not going to tip them off. It's some kind of livestock. It's gotcha. going to sound like some kind of wild bird or something, you know? And really, I mean, this is, I think a great point with regards to quail and even rabbits. I think quail and rabbits are livestock that if you do it right, mm. you can kind of sneak them in under the radar yeah. and, and raise and grow your own meat in places where perhaps it would be frowned upon. Yeah. They're, you know, with most communities that don't allow it, even when there's there's rules or ordinances against um, raising livestock, usually what it is is in, in many uh, locations is it's um, uh, if there's a complaint, uh, it's complaint driven ordinance. In other words, they will not they will not do anything about it unless one of your neighbors complain. Well, with chickens, they're out and about, and they're making lots of noise. You know, even the hens are, you're, they're cackling, they're making some noise. You know, people are going to know you have chickens. In other words, if you have neighbors close by, they're going to know you have chickens. Um, but if you have things like rabbits and, and quail, people aren't necessarily going to know it. If they, I mean, if they, you know, unless they're your close neighbors and you've told them, they probably don't know you and have them, especially if they're in cages and in, you know, in an area where they can't see them. And, the reality is if you can't see it, hear it, or smell it, do you really have them? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. And, and with, the, with rabbits and, and I, my understanding with quail, you're, you're not talking, I mean, well, we even talked about you're, you can raise them in rabbit size cages or rabbit mm-hmm. cages. So you're not talking a, a huge amount of infrastructure needed to support these guys. No, I mean, I have like, uh, mine are hanging on a wall. I mean, I have like this little lean-to I built off the side of my garage and it's got a tarp roof. I mean, it's all solid. I, You know, it's all, you know, good construction, but it does have a tarp roof and it's got chicken wire ends on the ends of it for some airflow and I'll even put fans in there in the summer. And I have cages uh, hanging on both sides of the wall, one side on the garage and the other side on the, on the, uh, the wall, you know, off the lean-to. And, um, and I walk right down the middle and how I have it set up is I have rabbits on one side and quail on the other. And it just works out really, really well. So I have, uh, I have five cages for each. I have five uh, quail cages and five rabbit cages. And, uh, you know, and sometimes I'll actually, what I've actually done lately is downsized the rabbits and then expanded the quail. So I might even take one of the rabbit cages and convert that over to a quail cage. And uh, that way I've just got a good rotation of quail. Cause I have, I have become quite fond of raising the quail over the rabbits. Rabbits ha- are great. I mean, I love rabbits. I love rabbit meat. I love raising them. They're easy animals to do. But there's just, because of that extra purpose in a, in a quail, you know, meaning meaning eggs. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, yes. so it's basically you get triple. You get, you know, you got the meat, you got the eggs, you got the fertilizer. Or you just have meat and fertilizer with the, uh, with the rabbits. Now, you can, if you're going to use the, the, the furs, Obviously, there's another use with rabbits, um, but uh, I, I just like the eggs. I think they're great, and I love the quick turnaround. It's even quicker than rabbits. Uh, wow! As far as getting eggs and meat, and they just grow so fast, they incubate so fast, and I just, I just love the whole process. So, with with the the quail, from the time they hatch, well, well let's talk about incubation first. So, mm-hmm. quail generally are not going to go broody, correct? Right. Uh, they've if. There's, they've been uh, domesticated for so long that Caternix quails just uh, generally, I've not heard of any cases. I mean, every once in a while I hear somebody say, well, you know, they had one that's hatched its own eggs, but it's very rare. You almost always have to, to uh, put their eggs in an incubator. So how long does it take to incubate quail eggs? 18 days. 
18 days. So that's yeah. even quicker than a chicken egg. Yep. Quite a bit quicker. Yeah. Yep. And, 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 and the hatch rates I don't think are quite as good as a chicken egg. I mean, I usually run 60, 70% hatch rate. I mean, it's not as good as a, as a uh, chicken egg. I don't think generally. Um, but, uh, it's really quick and you know, you can put so many of them in an incubator. Like for example, uh, when you have the, like my incubator, it's a, a farm innovator and, uh, I don't know how many, it has both the quail and the, um, the chicken egg turner. I can swap them out and put the quail egg, uh, turner in there and, uh, it holds 120 quail eggs. Oh, wow. So I, I don't generally have it full. I have had it full a couple times and then I've had way too many, uh, quail <laughs> I was going to say, if you, I mean, if you figure 120, if you had a 70% hatch rate, you're looking yeah. at what, 80, 80? Yeah, years? a no, lot. <laughs> no, a quail's called, quail babies called chicks. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that's what I call them. <laughs> All right. So, you know, it, it, it's funny. Each, each um, animal has its own terminology and you kind mm-hmm. of get into, you know, like with rabbits, you know, you learn about kits and kindling mm-hmm. and those kinds of things. Right. Um, so just want to make sure I got the terminology here. For all the quail people out there, don't want them sending me bad, <laughs> well, nasty it's, emails. Well, I'll get it too because that's what I call them. I don't know if it has a different name. I've never heard of it. I've never <laughs> heard right, well, different. So, <laughs> if you're lead, if you're wrong, I'm going to blame it on you. I'm throwing you, you under you the bus. That. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I've been there before. <laughs> so, from the time then that they hatch, um, how long until they start laying eggs? About six weeks. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's wow. pretty quick. Yeah. And, I mean, it's six to six, seven, right around that area. They'll, then they won't lay full right off the bat. I mean, you might get an egg here, an egg there. And then by eight weeks, they're laying an egg a day. Wow. And, and is it about the same amount of time for, for you to process them for meat purposes as well? Yeah. They're full grown seven, eight weeks. I mean, they're as wow. big as they're going to get. Yeah. So that's, that's the same time frame. That's actually quicker than rat, most I, rabbits. I find with rabbits, I generally have to go 10 to 12 weeks. And the reason right. is because I give them, a, I don't feed them pure pellets. Uh, on a pellet diet, rabbits tend to grow a little faster if you're just giving them a high protein pellet. I probably about 50-50, I give them, you know, a lot of uh, fodder and stuff to eat. So they grow a little slower on that, although I think it's, you know, a little healthier for them and, um, and of course, cheaper for me. Right, right. And and some of it really w- with regards to how quick a rabbit grows out is has to do with the br- the, the breeding yep. stock that you have in you right. know, the variety. Um, I mean, that was one of the things that we learned and, and not to go into last week's episode too deep, but uh, our journey into rabbits was not well planned and well executed. In fact, it wasn't planned at all. My dad dropped off rabbits uh, that we, we were supposed to rabbit sit for 10 days. And 10 months later, he came and got his rabbits. <laughs> and we learned a lot about bunny math along the way. But the the rabbits that he had were just some that people gave him. To this day, we don't know, really know much about them. But I do know that they weren't as feed efficient. Mm -hmm. Um, as if I had done a little bit more research in maybe bought a little better stock or, or whatnot. So, um, so definitely that plays into it with regards to, to rabbits. There's no doubt, but certainly, you know, eight weeks is definitely, um, that's the same amount of turnaround as with the Cornish cross. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it depends on the kind of quail. I mean, I raised the jumbo Caternix quail. There are some different kinds of Caternix quail. Um, the jumbos are the bigger, bigger ones, uh, but they're still not big. I mean, we're talking a pretty small bird. I mean, they're, they're really small. So it takes, you know, quite a bit to, to, uh, to get a decent amount of meat, really. I mean, you, you need to, you know, generate a lot of birds to, to get a, you know, a decent amount of meat. Uh, so, you know, there's that too. I mean, in, in the end, I mean, would I say I would prefer quail over, over chickens. And, and the answer is, you know, it depends in a, in a city situation. Absolutely. I would, I would prefer quail in the country. I would probably prefer chickens. Yeah. Yeah. But now the, the, the downside though is something that we just ran into today um, with regards to chicken. Well, maybe, maybe it isn't, maybe it isn't. Let me ask this question. When you process your quail, are you processing? So you, you, let's say you have a a group hatch today. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in eight weeks, they're ready. Um, if you hatched out, let's say 70 birds, are you doing all 70 at one whack or are you just doing them as you need them? I don't do 70 birds normally. (laughs) When I did, when I did do that a couple of times, I sold a few of them, gave a bunch away trying to get rid of them because I had way too many for my little setup here. Generally, I only do, I mean, I might like right now I have, I have eggs about four days away from hatching and I have 28 eggs in there. 
So okay. let's say, you know, sometimes one or two might die in the brooder, you know, before you get them in the cages. So if I end up with 20, 22 birds, you know, that that's what I'm going to generally get, you know, 20 to 25 birds at a time. What I and so get. then in eight weeks, are you going to dress off all 20 at one no, rack? No, th- those would become layers for a while. I would probably keep them for, you know, five, six, seven months. Uh, and I would actually process the older birds. Okay. I would wait for them to start laying. Then I would, you know, process the, uh, the older birds. And, and kind of where I'm going with this is with the Cornish cross meat birds, when you hit eight weeks, maybe you can push them to nine. If you're really feeling jiggy, you can go 10. After that, you, you're, you've got birds dying left and right because they just can't handle it. Yeah, not the case with these. I mean, I've kept the same birds for a couple of years. And and so where I think quail have a definite benefit over the Cornish cross mm-hmm. is what we found this. I mean, it's happened today. And that is my wife was walking by our freezer downstairs and she's like, this doesn't sound right. And our upright freezer is 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 going. It, and and we don't have another large backup freezer. We have a small our, our large upright, I think it's like a sec, a 16 cubic foot, um, freezer, mm-hmm. our small chest freezer, seven cubic feet. So even if the, the small one had been totally empty, um, you're not, I mean, I'm not a magician here. I wish I were, but, uh, you're not taking 16 cubic feet of food and putting it in a seven cubic foot freezer. Right. Um, and that, and, and, I mean, thankfully, we're at the spot right now. Again, it's being spring. You know, we've really driven down how much we stored in there. So we were able to get everything that we had remaining um, into the the seven, the, the the smaller freezer. But in three weeks, I've got 20 some odd meat birds that are freezer bound. Yeah. And I have to, I, I can't, it's not like I can say, well, I'll just, just keep feeding them. And it's just, I got the cost to feed. And then as I want them, I can dress them off. Mm-hmm. I, I've got to do it. And so one of the things that's happening right now, I'm not sure if you're aware of this. Uh, I wasn't aware of it until I went to try to buy a, a, a freezer, but freezers are sold out everywhere. Mm, no, I didn't. I wasn't aware of that. Um, because of this whole COVID thing, everybody's stocking up, wanting to get meat. And so they're, I mean, Best Buy sold out. Uh, Best Buy doesn't have a freezer within 250 miles of me. Wow. Um, Home Depot doesn't, uh, Lowe's doesn't, I mean, you know, I go, go on down the list. So I've got three weeks to either get my old one repaired or find another one somewhere. But all of that to say that with the quail, because of the fact that you can keep them living, <laughs> yeah, yeah. um, you, you kind of have a meal on the, I was going to say on the hoof, but they're not on the hoof, <laughs> <Right>. uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I generally process as I need. I might just go do, you know, a dozen birds at a time or something. I, I don't, uh, I won't do them all on the same day even. I mean, like sometimes if I just have a, you know, a couple hours here or there and they process so much quicker than a chicken. I mean, I can do a, I don't, uh, just pluck the feathers on them. I, I, I take the skin off, which mm-hmm. is a, so much quicker on a quail. I mean, it's just, you just unwrap them basically, but I can literally process a quail between 30 seconds and a minute each. I mean, it's so fast. Yeah, that's that's what I've heard. They're very, very easy to process, very quick to process. I think if you pluck them, of course, it would take a lot longer. But because I just tear the skin off of them, it just goes a lot faster. Mm-hmm. And then as far as, you know, how many would you, you want to have a, 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 ma- a meal of quail tonight? How many do you need? Well, I... I generally eat a couple by myself. I mean, one actually is okay. I mean, if you're going to really pig out, probably a couple per person. But I one per person is is plenty, really. I mean, uh, I think, yeah. I mean, on an average meal, is probably plenty. And and I hate to ask this question because, well, but I'm going to ask it anyhow. What does quail taste like? Now, I, 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 I <laughs> you always say it tastes like chicken. <laughs> no, I, I, I really don't want you to say it tastes like chicken. I, I want you to say it tastes like quail, but then I want you to kind of say, okay, well, but it tastes a little bit like. I would compare it. The closest thing I could probably compare it to is the dark meat of chicken. Okay. Yeah, I mean, honestly, that's just to me what it, it really. And it, it's all how you prepare it, of course, you know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's to me, it's it's really uh, quite like dark meat of chicken. Okay. Um, and so that's another benefit then to it. Just like with rabbits, you know, to me, rabbit tastes a lot like the white meat of chicken. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it's, 
it's not something that somebody has to get used to the taste. Like it's, you know, if you're not used to eating lamb or goat, that's a little bit of a different taste that to some people it's a bit of an acquired taste. Yeah. But with quail, then it wouldn't be. It'd be something that you pretty much, you know, you think you're eating chicken. Oh yeah. I mean, it's what, I mean, obviously they know they're not because they can just look at it and tell it's so much smaller and different, you know, but, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, to me, it's what it tastes like. Yeah. I mean, I compare it to that when I'm cooking it and it does cook a lot faster. You have to be careful because you can overcook it really easy because it's just a small bird, you know, so you have to be you know careful about your cooking processes, but yeah, it's, it's definitely turned into one of my favorite meats for sure. Good. And, and then as far as the eggs go, how, how would they compare to a, a chicken egg? A uh, little, uh, the, the yolk to white ratio is a little different. It, there's more, there's more, uh, yolk, um, you know, per, you know, in, in the comparably to the white. And so it's a little bit of richer of an egg okay. and, uh, I, I like it. I mean, I actually like it way better than a chicken egg. Wow. Interesting. But it takes about, it takes about four of them to equal a chicken egg too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, have you ever had duck eggs? I have. It's been a while. Yeah. And, you know, to me, those are richer in taste. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To me, they're a little bit rub- more rubbery if you fry them versus a chicken yeah. egg. Yeah. Quail wouldn't be like that. Uh, I, it's, it's hard to, you know, compare really, but yeah, I just find it a richer taste. And, and again, it takes a lot of them. I mean, you know, they're, they're harder to work with. Uh, I actually have some little scissors, you know, called quail egg cutters. And you, yeah, I've seen those. Yeah. You pop the end of the quail egg in and cut the end off and pour them out because they're, they're, if you're going to like try to crack them and, 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 and dump them in it, they're really messy. They're really hard to work with because of their size. Right, and also right. uh, to peel them, if you're going to boil them and peel them, really difficult. <laughs> I mean, really difficult. Interesting. Interesting. So pickled eggs, pickled quail eggs are, are not something that you do a lot. Well, uh, there's a little hack to that that okay. I figured out that somebody, I don't even know where I heard it at exactly, but if you uh, boil them and then soak them in a jar of vinegar overnight, white vinegar, the shells just dissolve. <laughs> ah, a little hack <laughs> there. Yeah, and you don't have to peel, but if you try to actually peel them after you've boiled them, oh man, yeah. what a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, you got to be pulling your hair out. But you will, get, you will, of course, get a little, if you're going to pickle them, it's really no big deal, but if you're just wanting to eat hard-boiled eggs... Uh, it w- when you soak them in that vinegar like that, they actually will take on a little bit of that vinegar taste. You know? Yeah, a little of that vinegar taste. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Interesting. So what is your favorite way to prepare quail? Oh, uh, wow. I, I like it anyway. <laughs> I mean, I really do. I I like to just throw them on the grill with a little barbecue sauce on them. You know, I mean, that's honestly it's just it's simple and easy. And I just love them like that. You know, I mean, it's just the best way. I just flatten them right out. You just kind of, you know, open them up and kind of press them flat and then spread them out a little bit on the grill and lay them right on the grill and, and just then coat them with some barbecue sauce. I'm telling you, that's, that's just a great way to have them. Yeah, that sounds so good. Oh, it yeah. sounds so good. So then with the, the quail kind of getting back to, you know, we've talked about the benefits of them from the standpoint of, of meat and from eggs, but you also are utilizing their manure as, as fertilizer. Yeah. And, and again, it's kind of like a chicken in the sense that you want to compost it okay. uh, because it is, you know, a little bit nitrogen rich and like rabbit, that's one of the great benefits of rabbit that you exactly. can put that manure straight on a garden. Absolutely, and I wouldn't advise that with quail. I mean, it is more like a chicken manure. So you do want to, you do want to uh, probably compost that for a, for a while. Uh huh. Okay. So that's, yeah, again, I'm, I'm kind of looking at this from the standpoints of the pros and the cons of the rabbit. Mm-hmm. So chalk one up for the rabbit there from the standpoint yep, that they're yep. not to say that the, the quail manure isn't good. It's just, it's going to have to be worked with composted before it can go right on. Into right. Your, yeah. Um, into your and and I, I'll give you another con. I'll give you another con. Uh, they're messy birds. <laughs> uh, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. They're messy and they'll waste a lot of food. Uh, mm-hmm. This is where a lot of people who raise them in an aviary on the ground actually win. And I've done that before because they don't go through near as much food because they'll, of course they'll throw it out of their feeders and then they'll eat it off the ground. Uh, when they're in cages, they drop a lot. And it goes right down in their waist and there's really no way to salvage it. Now, there's some different methods of where you can hang. Like there's uh, some folks that have, you know, designed feeders that go on the outside of the cage where they have to stick their head through the cage to eat out of it. And they can't sling it around quite as bad. That's, that makes it better. Uh, I, I've never done that, but I've seen, you know, how that works and it, it looks better. Um, but they're messy. I mean, they're really a messy bird. <laughs> Yeah, that I've I've heard that they they are very messy and they can be very wasteful of the feed. So yeah, yeah, 
Um, as far as what kind of feed do you do you feed a quail? Do they just eat regular chicken feed, or do they have a special diet? It, it is. It's a uh, higher protein um, uh, uh, feed. Uh, it's. Uh, it's small game feed. Um, turkey feed would be comparable to it, a higher protein. I can't remember what the protein is on. I'm thinking it's like 22 and plus and over. Oh, wow. So it's even it, more than broiler feed. Yeah. I think you can even get it up like 27%. It's pretty high. I mean, they got like a really high protein. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a definitely a, a richer protein feed. Um, and, and is it difficult to source it or can you get it no, I'm able to, or? yeah, I'm able to, I go down to our local rural King and, and buy it or tractor supply. They have it. Yeah. It's a, it's a small game because it's for, uh, they usually sell it just for a uh, uh, quail pheasants, uh, you know, just all the small game birds like that. Yeah. Okay. And about how much, about how much do they eat? It's hard to tell because they waste so much. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, when I had them on the ground, I just didn't seem like they ate that much, but, you know, but in, in, uh, in the cages, they go through a lot cause they sling it. And um, now, uh, I also feed them a lot of, um, you know, other things. I feed them a lot of comfrey because comfrey is so high in protein. I give them a lot of comfrey leaves. Uh, when that's when that's in season and when during the summer and they eat that a lot they peck at that and they just they devour it so you know i'm able to uh to save a lot of feed by giving them that okay interesting um and and speaking of that i i did get my package today so well, looking forward to getting that in the ground you were actually one of the first i ever heard talk about comfrey and ever since you you've then I, I've wanted to to get my hands on some, so I was so excited when it came back into stock. Well, I hope you enjoy it. I hope I didn't oversell it, but I sure use it an awful lot. Uh, it's it's well, it sounds to me like it's the miracle thing. So, uh, well, no. I, yeah, I would say that, but it definitely <laughs> it definitely provides. It saved me a lot of money over the years because of, you know the the feed it provides and just other things it does. I mean, I just uh, I just cut a bunch of it for chop and drop in my garden beds a day. I mean, I use it in my garden beds like crazy. I mean, it's a great great fertilizer for your gardens and i just chop it and drop it all around all my plants and just let it let it uh, decompose in the beds that's that's one of the things that i am i am so excited about using it for is is that um that yeah. exact thing but it grows it, so fast <laughs> and just the fact that you can use it for so many different things i mean you can use it for animal feed you can mm -hmm. use it for fertilizer for your garden um you can make a tea out of it as I understand it. Yeah. I've never, I've, I've never actually consumed it. Uh, uh -huh. now a lot of people do, but it's actually not advised to do that because it can, you know, there's it, it taken in too much quantity. It can actually have some well, issues. So uh, I, I won't advise that, but yeah, I've never done it. Yeah. Uh, gotcha. Some people do gotcha. though. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, so I'm, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to, uh, to giving it a go, but, uh, so that's something else you can, you can, that was going to be one of my questions with regards to quail. I know with rabbits, you know, if, if it were all to fall apart, um, you know, you could feed rabbits on fodder. You could feed them mm -hmm. on, on grass or, or, or hay. Um, they're not going to grow out as fast, but you certainly could do that. So with quail, you could use comfrey. Are there any other things you could feed them? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, I've fed them. I've gave them dandelion and plantain and mulberry leaves. And, you know, I've given them the same stuff I give rabbits and they just tear it up. They love it. <laughs> they peck at it like crazy and, and they will go through less of the, uh, the feed when I do that. I mean, they, they definitely get their protein from, from those plants when I do that. And, and I guess my question is, do you notice like with chickens, if we give them a lot of green stuff and, and all of that, their egg yolks end up becoming a lot darker orange. Do you see that with the quail? You know, their, their, their eggs are already that color. It seems like, so I don't notice a big difference, but I've always, I, then again, I've always given it to them. So I don't, I gotcha. Don't so you've never just fed them straight. Could be, I, you know, they get more feed in, in the winter, but I also, uh, I grow sunflower sprouts for them in the winter and I'll give okay. them some of, some of that as well. Okay. And, and as far as like with regards to the winter, um, your now where you're located at, what is winter to you? Well, I mean, <laughs> Let me I start mean, with that. I'm in <laughs> central Indiana, so it's probably, you know, it's probably not quite as bad as where you're at, but we have some pretty good winters. Okay. All right. So then you, you're talking, you know, you get cold, you get snow, you, oh, yeah. And, and obviously you've it was, got them. It was 27 degrees here last night. So, <laughs> okay. So you were actually even colder than we were. Yeah. So um, we, we have plenty of cold weather here. Did you get snow last no, night? No, we, we didn't get any snow. Uh, it was just going to be, a, it was just that fluke night too, because we've been having some nights and, you know, most of our nights have been forties and fifties yeah. for the last few weeks. And it was just this one night, you know, we had like a 27, 28 degree night coming and I had to get out there and cover everything up and just prep for it, you know? 
Yeah, yeah. We had we actually I think we got down into the like low thirties, I think maybe thirty three ish, somewhere in that range. Um, but we did get snow and in fact not right here, we didn't get quite hit as hard as people a couple of miles from us got four inches of snow. Oh wow. Um, it was yeah, crazy. That'd be a lot to deal with. I wouldn't want to mess with that. <laughs> I already I, I already put tomatoes out like two weeks ago, so I was really sweating. Oh wow, wow. Well, yeah. I, I actually was able to save them though. I Good. was yeah, I was, we, I double, I blanketed them and we had row cover over them. And I even took like my heat seed mats and laid on the ground around them uh-huh. and plugged them in underneath all that row cover just to try to generate a little heat and it saved them. <laughs> good. Well, good, good. Yeah. I hadn't gotten quite that jiggy yet. Um, I just have cold, cold crops out there. So I've got, you know, my spinach, my um, onions, you know, brassicas, things that should be able to handle that. Yeah. Yeah. I was definitely living on the edge by putting yeah. them out as early as I did, but I was, I, I always get anxious. I tell people they shouldn't, then I turn around and do it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you got to push the envelope. Just it's, it's all, and you know, you got to test it out. You got to test yeah. your theories. <laughs> so the quail then, um, I mean, obviously you've got them sheltered. It's not like we're leaving them out right. in a snowbank. Yeah. Um, but are you heating them in the wintertime? I'll tell you what, I've never seen an animal that would handle the uh the variations in temperature as well as a quail you know rabbits do great in the winter and they hate the summer oh, i mean yeah. they, it just tears them up when it's yeah. you know 90 something degrees outside they're looking like they're gonna die quail don't care either way i've i mean we've had 10 below zero and they're running around acting like it ain't even cold out and i've seen 100 degree days and they're acting the same way i don't get it but they're the i've never seen an animal that handles it so well wow wow and then as far as um with the winter and you know the the cold how are you handling the water situation for them yeah the water yeah they get they handle it well i don't handle it so well i have to go out there and, and i basically i just change everything out a couple times a day i change okay. it you know, I, I work full-time job so i change them out before i go to work in the morning i change them out when i you know before i go to bed at night and give them a couple you know the rabbits and the quail you know just a couple you know and, they, and they're smart animals they'll hit it as soon as they get it you know and drink yeah. a ton of it so i've never had any problem just doing that and with your rabbits, we just have not found a good winter water solution other than we have a couple of those plug-in waterers, yeah. but the, the the cords on them are so short. Right. And, and you got to have a pretty heavy duty extension cord to run those too. Yeah. If you put too light of an extension cord on them, they just will not heat up. Well, I had, I had an extension cord catch fire, but we're not going to yeah. talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> they, 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 they pull a lot of juice. And I've found that some rabbits will not bite down on those because they always have those bite down, uh, uh, nipples on them instead mm-hmm. of you know, the ball, you know, like with your yep. traditional rabbit waters, they got the ball. Right. And, and, and a rabbit that's used to that a lot of times won't do the bite down one. So they will not drink the water a lot of times. Ah, uh, now we that. haven't had that problem. Ours, ours, we actually leave the the winter ones in year round. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, they're used to it. I've had some rabbits that just would not, I mean, they would, they would almost die before they would drink it. <laughs> yeah. So, so you're just using the regular, um, waters and just swapping them out twice I a day. Do. Yeah. I keep a, I keep a, a five gallon bucket just filled up with, I mean, I have them, I just go out with a, I have them just dropped in a bucket and I, you go out and I swap them out and I put the old ones back in the bucket, take it in the house. And then if there's still a little bit of ice in them or whatever at the end of the day, I'll, you know, warm them up and take them back out again. And I just keep this bucket in the house and I just go in and out with it. And, and so then with the quail, what kind of waters are you using? Are you just little dishes or? Yep, there- they just have the regular little water, uh, uh, you know, with the, with the, uh, screw in jar on the top of them. okay yeah. so basically like the like, little it's like a chicken water yeah yeah the chick waterers but yeah for- it, yeah the quail is the quail one's a little bit narrower of a uh a, a, you know how the outer dish part around that is pretty wide on a chicken one for the quail there's generally a one that's a little bit more narrow and okay but yeah i use that one and okay yeah, it works great it just <laughs> they'll hit it as soon as they get it got it never, okay so you're just them. swapping them in and out yep i just a uh, couple times a day you just have mm-hmm. to swap them in and out and it, that's the best thing i found i mean there's there's heaters and there's all kinds of tricks but for me that just seems to be the easiest thing you know so so then with the with the quail it sounds to me like the management of it is very similar to that of the chicken from the standpoint of you know you give it a little feed and water every day you gather the eggs and that's pretty yep. much it 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, I usually get the eggs twice a day because of some of them it seems like some of them lay at night, some of them lay during the day. You know, it's just you never know. So I, especially in the winter time, I or, well, really all year round, cause you don't want them getting real hot either. Right. So I try to keep them out of there, and I'll grab the eggs a couple times a day, and usually forget a couple in my pocket and take them to work with me and have a mess, you know, and all yep. that kind of stuff. <laughs> but, oh yeah, uh, the pocket know. omelet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had, had it happen a couple times. <laughs> yeah, I gotta love those pocket omelets. Um, with with regards to the quail um like nesting boxes there's such a thing or they just kind of lay on the wire or what do they do yeah they just drop them right on the wire now there are some people who design their cages to where they actually lean a little bit and they'll have like a lip and they'll have like a little groove um at the bottom okay uh, where where the eggs will actually roll out of the cage and, okay. all, and they'll have like a bent of the cage where it kind of has a bend up outside mm-hmm. of the cage and they'll come down and lay on that. I've never got fancy about my design. I just reach in and grab the eggs. Not a big deal to me. Uh, but there I've seen that. I've seen people do that and they can just walk along and grab the, the eggs right out of the tray that way. Gotcha. Um, now do the, do the quail, you know, with, with chickens, you know, sometimes you end up with the poopy eggs, you end up with, yeah. you know, do you have the same issue with the quail? Yeah. Yeah. You definitely get that. I mean, it's, it's, that's real life, isn't it? I mean, yeah, yeah. We, we see the Instagram pictures where all the eggs are perfectly clean and they're grabbing them and they got them all in their basket and then not one of them's got any poop on them, but it's just not reality for yeah, me. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, well, half the pictures I see on Instagram of some of the chicken coops, I'm like, how in the world do they keep them so clean? Yeah. yeah, yeah they, you know, just, I, they clean it and then they take a picture. That's a good exactly. Thing. Exactly. Mine, I don't think mine's looked like that since the day we put chickens in there. Right, and right. It probably it, will it, never look like it again. Yeah, and that's the reality. Now, I, like I said, I've designed, kind of got a setup underneath my quail where it's, you know, I don't have the messes and stuff like maybe some people do. I've, I've got tarps all the way around the bottom because I've got them up there about, you know, chest high where the doors are. And, um, you know, I've got, uh, open cage underneath and then I've actually got an area underneath of them where I have some tarps all the way around that. And then I've just got uh, containers. I used to, uh, just a couple of years ago, I was actually doing uh, vermicomposting. Okay. Um, underneath them. I always just let it pile up and I had worms in there and I was vermicomposting it right where I laid. And then I would just kind of let it and I just clean it out or once in a while. And then it could pretty much have turned into worm castings, you know, and you could just put it straight on your garden. Mm-hmm. But, I, because of my setup and that worked great, but because of my setup, I don't have a lot of room in there to get in there with the wheelbarrow and the shovel. And it was just kind of inconvenient. It was really hard to do cleanup. Gotcha. Um, so what I started doing is I put totes. I actually have a whole row of totes, uh, small uh, plastic totes underneath them. Mm-hmm. And it just drops in there and I got tarps all the way around. So it doesn't go out in the aisleways and stuff. And then I can just take a tote at a time out just as quick as I want, dump it and put it back in. And it's a lot easier. <laughs> nice. Well, that sounds like that sounds like a great setup. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not bad. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I can't imagine, and you know, if you've got things kind of tight together, trying to get in there with a, a shovel and a and a wheelbarrow, I I can imagine would be a lot of fun. Yeah, it it works. I mean, you can do it, but it just it's so hard <laughs> just to get in there. I just don't have a lot of room to work in there because again, I'm in a in a small space. You know, I'm in a city limits. I got you know, I'm limited on space, so I'm trying to really. I try to design things to where I have just enough room, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As far as, so you said that you prefer right now, you kind of are leaning more quail over rabbit? Just because of the eggs. Yeah. The eggs. And, 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 and the processing. Uh, mm-hmm. I find rabbit processing is a little messy. You know, it's, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of stuff in there <laughs> and uh, it's pretty messy. We're a quail. I mean, you got like a, you can take a little, like, like a little shopping bag from Walmart and, you know, process a dozen quail and you, you know, you can stuff it all in that and have plenty of room for extra, <laughs> you know, it just, there's not a lot of leftovers. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the thing is with rabbit, I find rabbit easier than chicken. Yeah. I, I, I think, I think it is too. Um, but but I think quail just even is way better than that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, and, and I, I can imagine as far as with the quail, just the the amount of leftovers, shall we say, is definitely yeah. going to be a lot less. Probably you process twenty quail and you've got less um, leftovers than you do from one rabbit. Yeah, I would say yeah, you do. Yeah. No, the thing about the rabbits, I absolutely love the um, the livers from rabbit. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm not yeah. a liver guy. Um, I just don't you generally like the for me, it's generally more the texture of mm-hmm. liver, but there also is something about that almost a bitter taste that liver has a tendency to have. Yeah, um, I don't find that with rabbit. 
Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I think some of the organs are well, and, and even quail too. I tell you what, uh, we're probably going to gross out some of your audience here. I don't know. Quail hearts are really good. Now, how do they compare to chicken heart? Cause I love chicken heart. I don't think I've ever ate a chicken heart. So oh. I don't, I don't know, but, oh, uh, but I, now, yeah. Now, yeah. Now, they're now they're really got small. Me. They're really small. So you don't get a lot there, but they're really good. Yeah. Oh, that sounds so good. Oh, see, I, I used to live in Brazil. My mom and dad were missionaries in Brazil and you would go to the churrascarias and they would have on the spit, they would have chicken heart mm-hmm. and uh, just right over the, that they'd roast it over the, the fire. And uh, man, oh, that, that's just good eating right there. Yeah, it is. It really is. I mean, it's surprising if, if, if you're a person who's never had that, it's actually really good. Yeah. And I know, and I know some people that are like, oh my goodness, it's, but you know, to me and, and not that I'm trying to guilt trip anybody. But I do think that when you raise and grow your own food, you start to value it, I think, in a different way. And you want to use as much of it as you can. You don't want to just be tossing stuff in the ground. Right. And, and, the, and the reality is, yeah, you, you, when you raise an animal, you just you, you take on a, a respect for that animal that you probably never had before, any kind of animal. And, uh, and when it's time to process it, you, want to, you kind of want to honor that. You, know, you want to do as much with that as you can. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. I I think that, uh, I mean, I think that's a big part of the problem, not to go too much into the weeds with regards to that, but a big part of the problem that we have in in society today is we've become so disconnected from our food that we just don't value it like we should. Right, right. But I also don't want to feel guilty about throwing things maybe that I don't like in the compost bin because you know what, I'm still making use of that animal, (laughs) you know. Yes, that no, that's that's absolutely a great point. And I would never ever want anybody to go away from this saying that, you know, feeling guilt tripped into eating quail heart. If you don't like quail heart, don't eat quail heart. If you don't like chicken heart, don't eat chicken heart. But, you know, maybe give it to your dog. Or yeah, it, you it know, has you know, other uses. Yeah, sure. It can, know, be, it can be used. I mean, it ain't like you're stowing it in a garbage bag and putting it in your trash can. I mean, you can definitely make use of it in another way. Exactly. Absolutely. And, you know, and quite frankly, we don't, you know, there are some people that will take the heads of chickens and they'll make broth out. We don't do that. Yeah. You, you know, so I, you, you got to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I yeah, guess. yeah. You can get radical with it and use every single piece of everything. And yeah, I, I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> right, right, right. But, uh, you know, on the other hand, I, I do think there is something to be said about the fact that when you have raised it, you've grown it, you know, you, you've processed it. There's definitely a value that you, you definitely assign to it that, oh, yeah. um, that you don't get from just dropping some federal reserve notes on the, uh, counter at, at, uh, the supermarket when you're, you're picking something up. Absolutely. And it, you know, every time uh, I eat meat, I mean, I just have a different, you know, but I, was, I mean, I was raised, you know, eating meat that we raised, you know, so I mean, I, I'm no stranger to it. But when you, I don't know, when you're an adult and you do it yourself and you're processing, you're doing everything. I mean, especially with the quail. I mean, I, I, grab, I grab the eggs. I put them in the incubator. I watch them hatch. I, I get them out of the brooder. I put them in the cages. I collect eggs from them. Then the day comes where I process them and I cook them and I eat them. There's something special about that. There really is. Absolutely. And, and there's, there's just, and whether it's quail, whether it's a, I mean, it can be something as simple as a salad, but mm-hmm. when you have, yep. when you have put blood, sweat and tears into, and sometimes it's literally tears um, into something. And then you sit down and you look at your plate and you know, a good portion of that plate is something that you have had a direct hand in producing there is a sense of satisfaction that comes from that that I, I think is unparalleled. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think the stuff tastes better in general, but then you just add that little spice on top and it just puts it right over the top. <laughs> I'm with you. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll, take, uh, I'll take food growing in my backyard anytime <laughs> over something from a restaurant or a store. Absolutely. And, and, and again, coming back to kind of where we started at, you know, this is something you're doing this on a tenth of an acre. And this is something, you know, maybe not everybody can raise rabbits and quail, um, but everybody can do something. Yeah. And so everybody can st- have that sense of satisfaction. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's something you can make, if you can you grow just enough stuff to put a salad together once a week and, and pretty much just about anybody could do that. Even if you had to do it under grow lights in a room, uh, that would be something, you know, to sit down and eat a salad that you grew. 
Absolutely. I, and and I and it would it would be the best tasting salad. I'm convinced of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I I've shared this story before on the podcast. I, I I'm not sure if you caught this um or not, but I did hear of a gentleman who actually I saw it on a Facebook group who he showed an omelet that he was preparing using quail eggs. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm sure it took a lot of quail eggs to prepare this omelet. Um, but the story that he shared was this. He lived in an apartment and he was raising quail in an aquarium in the middle of his living room. <laughs> and now I'm not necessarily suggesting that everybody's going to be down with that. Yeah, I probably wouldn't do it. <laughs> I, I'm not sure my wife would put up with that. But my point is that if you're creative enough, I think everybody can do at least something. They may not be raising quail, but everybody can do something. I've seen, I've seen many people doing it in their garage, you know, just in their one and a half car garage, have a setup for raising quail and grab, you know, several eggs a day out of that, out of that little quail setup uh, right there in their garage. And, and there's a lot of people who can do that. Well, this has been great, Harold. I really, really appreciate um, you taking the time to talk quail with me. And uh, I have certainly learned a lot and, Unfortunately, I think the problem with a conversation like this is it now kind of whets my appetite even more. <laughs> <laughs> I say go for it. <laughs> uh, and it's like, you know, there comes a point in time, it's like, I got to slow my roll here, but I want to try this and I want to taste these. And, yeah. uh, and so I really, really appreciate it. I have, I have really learned um, a lot from this. And uh, if anybody has any questions about this, um, I will put, uh, because I'm not going to be able to answer them. So you could email me all day and I'm going to have no clue. I can make stuff up. Um, I'm really good at doing that, but uh, I will put links to um, your uh, website and uh, to to your podcast uh, in the show notes. But is there a way that they could get a hold of you directly? Uh, yeah, my website. I mean, you, you go to my website and all the information's there, haroldthornbrode.com. And there's, a, and there's, there's, uh, I think I've done a couple podcasts just all on quail, kind of similar to this. I've done, you know, some blog posts about it. And, uh, I'll tell you what, there's a lot of great resources out there on YouTube too. I mean, probably, you know, most of what I learned about quail in the beginning came from YouTube. So, you know, you can go down that path and, and you can find out some really good stuff from some people out there. that has been doing it a lot longer than me even. Well, excellent. Well, again, thank you very much. I really have enjoyed this. Well, it's been a pleasure being with you today, Brian. Well, folks, I hope that you enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed chatting with Harold. Uh, I learned so much uh, on this podcast. I hope you did as well. And I hope that this will help you if you are trying to decide what kind of meat animals to raise on your homestead, then I hope that this will help as we talked about the benefits and the drawbacks of the three smaller options as I see them the meat birds, the uh, rabbits, and the quail, that this will help you make at least maybe a better decision, uh, hopefully an informed decision, (laughs) with regards to the direction that you're going uh, to take. And if you have any questions for me, you can reach out to me, brian at thehomesteadjourney.net. You can also check out our website, thehomesteadjourney.net. If you have any quail-related questions, then I would recommend that you take uh, a look at Harold's website. I am going to put a link to it as well as to his podcast in the show notes. So if you want to uh, get more information on quail, he's going to be your best resource. But Harold, uh, once again, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join me here on the Homestead Journey podcast. It was an absolute pleasure and I really, really enjoyed it. If you enjoy what you're hearing here on the Homestead Journey podcast, if you could do me a huge favor and jump over to your favorite podcast player and leave me a review or a thumbs up or whatever they allow, I would greatly appreciate it. And then if you could share this with friends and family maybe even enemies, (laughs) I would also appreciate that. Folks, I do really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to join me here on the Homestead Journey podcast. As always, the music on this episode has been provided by audionautics.com, so a big shout out to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.